Okay. Um, Jeremy gave me my instructions. Um, you can read about what I have to say about this at length in, in the magazine. But in the context of this, of this group, I thought my real job is, is difficult. It is to talk about something which isn't so. Jeremy alluded to that just now. So I've divided the topic into three, natural selection, which is so, the human genome, which is so, and the idea of race, which is not so. And I, I have a task to be careful to lay out not the reasons why we cling so to an idea that's not so, but to try and say what is so that underlies the fact that we wish that it weren't so because we hold to the idea of race instead. So I hope you'll be patient with me as I give what may appear to be uh, a tedious academic biological introduction, but it's not. It's what's so. And let me begin with where I want to close with what's not so. This is an ad. Some of you in the city will have seen it uh, on bus terminals for a movie that isn't out yet called Surrogates. And it says, human perfection, what could go wrong? And that's where I want to end up. I want to end up by saying that the, the idea of race is an idea of human perfection at base. And what could go wrong is whatever goes wrong when an idea is not borne out by reality. So to begin with, oh, dear me. We now have a technological glitch, which we'll deal with by me talking. OK. This figure won't show on Shelley Krimsky's PC because it's made on and for a Mac, which I didn't bring. So the purpose of this slide would have been to say that the planet has been remarkably stable in climatological terms for the last 10,000 years, a period called the Holocene, in which time humans have populated the planet. And in the last 400 years of that 10,000 years, uh, our species has undergone an enormous increase in numbers from the hundreds of millions to the tens, 10 billion, and simultaneously has affected global systems, including sea levels, global temperature, denudation of forests and croplands, and so discontinuously changed the planet that geologists speak of this as the beginning of a new geological era called the Anthropocene the time during which humans determine the situation rather than other processes. And I, I put that up there because the Anthropocene is 400 years plus or minus. Embedded in it is all of science, all of the intellectual activity that underlies, I would say, our modern notion that there must be something like race to explain the differences among us. To give you a context of how bizarre it is, in natural terms, to be concerned about an idea that's only a couple of hundred years old, let's look at how old things are in nature. Let's imagine the universe, which is about 13.7 billion years old, to be extended in time as a series of texts, one million years per page of these texts, 450 pages per volume. They'd be 30 volumes today, and today is the top page. Well, the unexpected fact is nothing, nothing at all for the first 18 volumes. The sun doesn't form until sometime in, in, in volume 19. So nothing where we are existed for most of the time of the universe. Then nothing complicated happens here for the next two volumes. Then in about volume 21, something novel occurs. Uh, an informational, as I say on the slide, self-copying chemical structure appears, capable of carrying information, copying itself, driving chemical consequences of copying so that changes in the information that enhance copying will be trapped as new DNA sequences. In other words, an information-carrying, self-replicating machine for the preservation of novel information appears sometime in volume 21. And this became clear only in the late Anthropocene, that is to say in the last 50, 60 years. This is a quote from Jim Watson and Francis Crick's paper. 
that DNA structure, which I hope will come up on this slide, it does, has the capacity exactly to do what, what is required of the persistence of life. The information in a sequence of letters along the double chain of DNA, when the DNA separates, is captured exactly by each of the strands as each strand copies a T for an A, a T for an A, making two versions of an initial strand. The sequence on the other chain is automatically determined by the sequence on the first chain. Semi-conservative replication is a machine for the preservation of a baseline level of information once novelty occurs, the initial version and the novel version may compete with each other. So the long-term consequence of this is as follows. Since volume 21 till today, a DNA sequence incurs, encodes another sequence in, in a molecule called RNA, which then encodes a sequence of structural subunits called amino acids, which then encode the structure of a protein, which finally encodes meaning. The structures of proteins encoded by DNA are meanings. The meaning of a protein is what it does. So this self-replicating ancient, but only ancient for us, modern for the history of the universe, four billion year old molecule, is making novel functions when it's making novel information. That's our ancestry. And that goes for all organisms ever since. You probably know this, but I'll summarize it anyway. DNA is a meaningful, universal, chemical, historical, textual language, and life has been written in that language for four billion years. So half of my talk is not going to be about race, it's going to be about what's so, and the second half will be about race. How does this language get written over time if all individual living things must die? Through species. Living things may or may not be fertile. When they are fertile, they make offspring by definition. Offspring live on after the death of their parents. A species is a set of all living things who, which, or for us, who, are able to make fertile offspring with each other. Life survives or not in species. So the improbable fact is, on examination, and Jeremy was in the White House when this was announced for our genome, and Francis Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project, is now the head of the entire National Institutes of Health. We now have the tools, the Anthropocene-era, self-reflective human tools to understand the information that makes us. We have the complete genome sequences for hundreds of different species and thousands of humans. And what we find is all DNAs, not just all human DNA, share sequences. We are all, all living things, one family. I would venture to say that uh, 100 years ago, when Darwin wrote Origin of Species, this was not imaginable that we should be chemical, informational, textural, historical, that was understandable, but that you could find informational proof of ancestral links, that is to say family relationships among all living things, is unbelievably, wonderfully, cleanly, elegantly resolving the problem of where we come from. The fourth floor of this building, if you're done here or take a break, Go up and walk around the periphery of it, and you can see the history of vertebrates played out from the first ones coming out of the ocean to us in skeletal and fossil form. Quite a remarkable display. Okay. Now, Darwin, at that time, 100 years ago, asks, well, where do species come from? And he says, well, species actually come from species. That is to say, there is continuity with difference over time. The origin of a species is always an ancestral species. Uh, that, I think, probably most of you know. What you don't know is the immediate response to Darwin. Um, the Royal Society didn't catch it. People didn't catch it. It was too unlikely, almost as unlikely as Jeremy's statement that despite the fact that we know we are different from each other, we look different, some of us look like others of us, and some of us look different from us, 
Despite that, we are essentially genetically a very new and very homogeneous species. That's as unintuitive as Darwin's idea was 100 years ago, which is now the orthodoxy of this building. So there is hope that race need not be a persistent error, as this was an early error in the response to Darwin. Okay. In evolutionary Darwinian DNA terms, different species have different genomes that share ancestral sequences, and the semi-conservative replication of DNA will permit the persistence of new meanings. So to go back to the universe in 30 volumes, the first DNA forms of life, archaeobacteria, come up in volume 22. Only bacteria exist in volume 23 and 24, but in volume 24, bacteria in the ocean learn to eat light, to eat light and convert carbon dioxide to themselves. They spit out from carbon dioxide the oxygen and taking that into the atmosphere, convert it to the oxygenized atmosphere, which allows later on for the emergence of things that use oxygen to burn the food they eat. Nothing more elegant than a plant. Imagine eating light. Okay. The first big cells of the sort we're made appear in the sea only in volume 25, and things made of many of those big cells appear only in volume 27. Animals appear by volume 28, but they persist in the ocean through most of volume 29, nothing on land that we know, until at the end of volume 29, things with four legs, the first tetrapods, emerge from the oceans onto the land. Notice where we are. We're at the third, the 30th and last volume. Dinosaurs appear in the middle of the current volume, but they're wiped out on page 385 of 450 when 65 million years ago an asteroid throws up a sufficient amount of material into the atmosphere to shut down photosynthesis and presumably disturb the structures of, of ecology sufficiently to kill all large animals and plants, including the dinosaurs. The small ones that flew are today's birds. Now, where are we? Mammalian ancestors of the cat and us, and you'll notice that there's a cat and there's a person, the ancestors of the cat and us would thrive in those last 65 pages until today. And the last ancestor of both us and our nearest living relative, the chimp, would die off only about 10 pages from the end of this book as of today. So to summarize, we are very, very young. And we are part of an endless frontier we have no way to know in advance the full meaning of any gene, let alone any genome, let alone our own genome. We cannot claim capacity to understand the full meaning because that meaning will be played out in the future as natural selection selects for variations now present in us which we cannot know the utility of. So I like Eliot's summary. The best you can do is know where you started from and understand it. You cannot know where you're going. So to summarize halfway, there's one history that links all living things, not just all people. DNA life, having begun once, never ends. So when people ask, you know, when does life begin, it began once, it never ends. It's lives begin, but life began only once. Now, how do we confront race in this Anthropocene period? What are the boundaries set by what science knows? First, I said before. DNA-based life is chemical, textural, improbable, and historical, and therefore so are all of us. Second, DNA-based life is a product of natural selection, as Darwin predicted, and so are we. Third, there is an exception. Our mental worlds are unrestricted by our DNA. That's novel. It can't be older than 100,000 years at most, 200,000 years so novel as to be shockingly discontinuous, as is the Anthropocene era. Discontinuity is the subtext of my talk. So back to the universe in 30 volumes. We humans would have had a note about our emergence in Africa about two